two molecules that I've shown you, what we now know is that bacteria can distinguish self from other, right? They have a molecule that says me and they have a molecule that says you. That, I would argue, is exactly what also what happens in your body. It's not like your kidney cells get all mixed up with your heart cells every day. And that's because there's different chemicals, hormones, that tell your kidney cells to do certain jobs and your heart cells to do other jobs. Again, we think the principles for how that occurred on Earth happened in bacteria billions of years ago. And yes, it's true that the molecules in our bodies have more bells and whistles. They're more complicated molecules. But the ideas, we think, are all there in the bacteria. So we think that it's useful to study these simple model systems in order to inform people, you know, hopefully help people that study higher organisms. Um, and of course, um, there's a practical part of this, which is that we can develop strategies, as, as I've shown you, to impede quorum sensing in harmful bacteria, but then also just to finish with a plug for all the beneficial bacteria that we talked about at the beginning of the seminar, we now know, right, that we're just loaded with all these bacteria that do all these good things for us. So besides trying to make anti-quorum sensing molecules to, to interfere with pathogenesis, what we're also trying to do with the analogous strategies that I showed you is to get pro-quorum sensing molecules. So if we could get molecules that make the conversation better in your commensal bacteria at the expense of the invaders, maybe that's the actual way we ought to be thinking about treating bacteria going forward, is to actually make the conversation in the bacteria that are always living in us or on us more robust and that would let them treat the bacteria that are trying to invade us. So we and others are looking for both molecules that inhibit and molecules that enhance quorum sensing, and both for these medical purposes, but also for all kinds of industrial purposes. So we use bacteria for all kinds of things, you know, as little machines, right, to make things that we want. You know, they make drugs for us, they make all kinds of agricultural products, you know. We'd like to actually make those strategies better, both in medicine and in technology, right, by manipulating quorum sensing. And then the final thing to do is to, to make a little confession that this idea of interfering with this conversation is not ours. Again, these bacteria have had billions of years of head starts. Now that we understand that bacteria have, cor have quorum sensing, what we and lots of my colleagues in the field have started to do is to think, well, aren't they already manipulating these conversations and so now people can go out and they can just look in soil or look on your skin and they can find that one guy is you know there talking with one of these molecules that I showed you and the guy next to it in the dirt makes a um, enzyme that cuts the ring off that chain like I showed you and so the one guy is trying to talk and the guy next to it in the dirt is making it mute right they eat each other's molecules they eavesdrop on each other's they free ride they make antagonist and so maybe the best thing to do instead of trying to figure these strategies out de novo is that we should just learn about the strategies the bacteria have already evolved and pick the ones that they have already optimized through evolution and so there's a really um, fun part of the field which is now just looking out there for these natural pro and anti quorum sensing strategies and trying to adapt them for biotechnology. And then finally, this is my gang. So um, I'm at Princeton. I guess you guys know, you know I have like a <laughs> big advertisement. And so just to, to say that everything I told you about was done by somebody between the age of 20 and 30, right? And so whenever you guys like read the newspaper, you get to hear you know, some talk about you know, some ridiculous, crazy new way that the natural world works. I guarantee you it was done by somebody in this demographic. And so it's a really fun um, environment for those young people who are interested in science to work in. I keep getting older and older and they're all always exactly the same age and it's a huge exhausting rush to work with them right because they're completely um tireless and they don't believe the world works the way that they've learned and they're interested to like take the next step and so it's a totally amazing um wonderful life that i have first because i get to come out here and blab about this stuff that i didn't even do but also because I work with this incredibly curious gang of young people, right? And that is the engine that drives science in this country. It's always this 20 to 30 year old group. And so again, to the Annie back there, thank you very much for having me. And thank you guys for almost braving the rain and coming out uh, to hear this. And I guess it, we have questions and answers, right? Yeah. Uh, so E.O. Wilson and Bert Hull-Doubler have been talking about ants as superorganisms, and, uh, and it has to do with how they communicate and cooperate and things like that. Is this the same model? You want my opinion? Yeah. <laughs> so, of course, yeah. So, of course, so I think this is the progenitor 
to that, right? So, so you guys probably know that ants and bees have these unbelievably cool social structures. It's all chemical. They're following each other's trails. They leave, you know, so it's all chemical communication that sets up those amazing social networks, right? And so what we know that is that these are not exactly the same molecules because, you know, we have these genomes. And so these molecules are the bacterial ones Right, but when we put these, so just like we have genomic databases to put genes in, you can, there's chemical databases too. So you can take your favorite chemical, which you saw mine, and put it in and ask, is there anything like it? And it turns out that the molecules that are the closest in structure to the ones that I showed you exist in ants and cockroaches and all of these bugs, big bugs, those are, you know, that actually do this social behavior, right? So we know that the genes I showed you, the molecules that I showed you, they won't be in higher organisms. We have their genomes, they're not there. But I think it's one bell and whistle and you get this ant and bumble and a honeybee thing and then a few bells and whistles and you get us. But, the, but it's, I think that, that, and it's a matter of time too, there could be molecules that are absolutely in common, right? And we just don't know them yet, right? So these bacteria can be swimming in molecules, and if it doesn't impinge on bioluminescence, we don't know about it, right? You know, so it could be that we found the most obvious first couple and that we actually will find molecules that are in common with higher organisms, but so far that hasn't happened. But the rules are the same, the molecules are similar, and how the information gets transduced is identical. Yeah. Um, I actually came because of your title. I'm sort of a social scientist. And so my, this idea that a, a tiny organism like this can distinguish between self and other to me is fascinating. But the next question that I would ask is can they distinguish between friendly other and unfriendly yeah. other? Right, so that's where this is, so the answer is I don't know, but if I were to guess, <laughs> right? Yeah, so right, so there's more than two molecules because you're absolutely right, right? The two molecules I show you say me and they say other. And they do not, what, what that second molecule absolutely does not do is say who the other guy is because they're all using the same molecule. So you got that. But what we know is when we look at these biofilms, right, so that's where these bacteria are on these surfaces in these incredible consortia that can have hundreds of species, right? So I'll give you an example. It's always nice after the snacks. The one you know about is on your teeth. So every morning you wake up, you have those little sweaters on your teeth, right? There are 600 species of bacteria in that every morning. I assume you brush them off and they're back the next day. And so if we look at them, like under the microscope, like I showed you that one, if you look at those, they're not willy-nilly, you know, like everybody's just wherever. They are the exact same structure every single morning. So it's an architected community with a blueprint, you know, the car mechanic, the grocer, the librarian, and we know that they each do their specialized jobs. You can only get that structure if they do know who the other guy is, right? You can't, just knowing self and other won't give you that, but knowing who the other guy gives you order. And so we think, so the next set of molecules that everybody's trying to find now, I mean, I need a job, right? I'm not done, right? Yeah, so we only know these couple so far. I mean, there's a few more that we know, but the next ones everybody wants are the ones that say who the other guy is, because we think that that level of complexity has to be there by looking at the structures, right? And then I think encoded in who, is going to be things like, you're my foe and you're my friend, right? Like, I will work with you and I won't work with you because I'm not getting anything back, right? And that is the next few years of this field, right? Right, and it's just sort of, you know, like, I always like, feel like I'm making excuses, you know, we couldn't believe a dozen years ago that bacteria could talk. Then we found this one molecule, and we thought, wow, you know, and then you find this other molecule, you think, oh my God, they're gonna talk between species, you know, but now, like, I, I, I think it has to be like that because I think that's what happens, you know, in us, right? Yeah. That's a great question. We are hunting for those. We have tricks that we think will make them tell us those molecules. I understand why the pathogenic bacteria would want to have that strategy of just hang tight until we can mount a defense against the host. Why would commensal bacteria want to have such a mechanism? Yeah. So the commensal bacteria also need to know when they're in groups to carry out good tasks like Right, so, so I think that what happens, for example,